As I said, today we're starting our series called Killing Spiders. Yeah, it's kind of creepy, it's kind of weird, it's a lot different, but the, the thing that it comes about is I heard this story once, and it was about a summer evening, the thunderstorm was passing through, and a mom was tucking her little boy into bed. And as she was tucking him in, and he was getting scared from the storm, he, he kind of asked gently, he said, Mom, would you please stay with me all night? Well, as she turned off the lights and gently gave him a hug that just reassured him that she's always there, she says... No, son, I need to stay in Daddy's room. And there's this quite long pause, and finally it's broken by this shaky little voice, and you hear the little boy say, that big sissy. <laughs> <clears throat> but what we're reminded is we all have fears. We all have things that kind of caught us off guard, and, and they cripple us. And, and the thing is, though, as I was reading through some of these lists of all the phobias of 2017, there's a lot of different phobias. And there's a lot of things, as much as you think, well, man, can this really be a real phobia? And, and I looked at it and I was like, it didn't make any sense to me. Then I was like, it hit me that for some people, some of these things are so real and so life-altering and so stopping them in their tracks, they can't move. That as we examine these things, it, it's real. And how is that a play for us in our lives? And so I looked at these phobias, and I'll be honest, I'm going to butcher about all of these, all ten of these, so I apologize now. It's like reading, you know, the introduction to Matthew 1, talking about the, the history and genealogy of Jesus' life and his family, all those names. Whew. All right. But we'll try our best here. So number 10, we'll work our backwards letterman style. Uh, tyrophobia, the fear of holes. Fear of holes. Ears on the ground and your meat. They said they had to struggle with holes. Number 9, aerophobia, the fear of flying. Number 8, mysophobia, the fear of germs. Number seven, claustrophobia, the fear of small spaces. Number six, astrophobia, the fear of thunder and lightning. Number five, synthophobia, the fear of dogs. Or, yeah, we're close enough. All right. Number four, agrophobia, the fear of open or crowded spaces. Number three, acrophobia, the fear of heights. Number two, ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes. Ugh, yeah, we all said that. Okay. And number one, arachnophobia, the fear of... Spiders. Now let's be honest, spiders creep us out. They, they can come up from anywhere. They sneak upon us. Some species can even be dangerous to us. But here's the thing. And if you guys are like my wife, you probably might even overdramatize the size of the spider. Right? Get home right now. This thing's huge. And it's a little spider in the corner, right? But so in our lives, sometimes we overdramatize the size of what this is. But we'll hear what we all can agree on. Spiders kind of creep us out. But the problem is... We live around them all the time. Myth even has it that you might eat about eight spiders a year while you sleep. So times that by your age, and that might be even more disturbing. But here's the thing. So often we might not even understand there's a spider even around us. But we are aware of the web. Right? We understand that we sense a web all the time. We can walk right into them and it just drives us crazy. This last week, I even preparing for this, I was handing signage around the building. I literally walked into a web, and out of response, it looked like this. Ah! No joke. Literally, like, I busted out, and I acted so out of character because I couldn't get it off my face. I couldn't figure out where is it coming from. Why is it still sticking to me? And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. At the same time, as you get caught into a web of our lives, as we get caught into it, as our lives move around and we're changed by all these things, we walk into a web, our deepest fears and anxiety and worries, it sticks us, just like that web. And as much as we try to handle ourselves and to walk in character, we walk outside the grace of God sometimes. Our natural reaction is outside of that bearing, just like as I walked into the web, arms failing, everything going crazy, that's our lives as we get caught into that web. And we begin to see as we go through this process of our lives and our homes, and we can spend detailed hours cleaning our houses, working to get the webs out to make sure we spring clean, everything looks nice, but here's the thing we know, within a few days, the web's back. And the thing is though, while we take care of the main areas of our lives, there's always those areas underneath the stairs, in the back corner of the garage, there's always that spider web. We gave up. It's just easier to let it dwell there than to keep going back and to keep cleaning it out and keep cleaning it out. And so what happens is we end up living with these spiders around us all the time. 
I've been reading a book and it's by Carlos Whitaker and it's actually Kill the Spider. And as you think about it, as he's writing here, he's talking about how he's gone on this amazing journey and he's led worship in some of the biggest churches in America and now he's switched over to preaching. And he's been touring, he's been speaking at all these major conferences and he's talking about a time that he went into rehab to become a better father, better husband to be a better preacher and he's in this extensive week and so as he's going in he's going to be away from his phone he's on the phone with his dad just right he's going his dad's like son I need to tell you something and this is where the inspiration came from for this series as I was reading the introduction to the book this is what stood out to me and is life-changing as I kept underlining and marking notes by it but I'll summarize it for you. he says early on son I was preaching at a revival in Panama and I was here and on the first night of the three-day revival, I was preaching my heart out, and I was giving it all that I had. And at the altar call, people were coming forward, and here, one of them in particular is Miss Ramirez. She comes forward, I was touched by your sermon. I was touched by God. Would you please pray that the cob of my life would be removed? And so his response is easy. He says, yes, God, please remove the cob from Mrs. Ramirez's life. Well, the night two came, and here he is again, preaching his heart out. And at the altar call, he sees her stand up once again to come forward. Pastor, pastor, would you please pray to God that he'd remove the cobwebs from my life? Mrs. Ramirez, we just did this last, I know, please pray for it again. So he did. Then night three came. People were still coming forward. I couldn't believe it. And yet here I see in the back standing up was Mrs. Ramirez coming down. Preacher, preacher, would you please Pray to God that he would remove the cobwebs. And right there, he stops her. He stops her in the middle of her sins because he realized that so long for this whole week of the revival, he'd been praying the wrong prayer. He says, And so I prayed, Father, we do not ask you to take tonight to clean the cobwebs from Mrs. Ramirez's life. In fact, Lord, keep them there for now. But tonight, we are asking for something much greater. Tonight we are asking that you kill the spider in Mrs. Ramirez's life. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. How insightful is that we can go through life and we can clear out the cobwebs of our life continually, straightening things up and organizing and hiding the fact that there's a problem there. And yet, the spider's the problem. The cobwebs are just the remnants, the sign of the problem. And the only way to clear the cobwebs for real is to kill the spider. Find the things that's producing the fear, anxiety, the struggle in this journey. So as we look at these things, the first part that we're looking at today is just the fear of control. The the process. And we understand as we go through this, we all have spiders. And here's the thing right now, not to freak you all out, but you probably have a spider at some point at your home right now. And it didn't bother you this morning until now that I warned you about it. But the problem is, it wouldn't bother you until now, until you actually saw it come out. Until that point, you were happy. You were subtle with it, just being there. We weren't aware of it. And so oftentimes, we don't do anything until it arises, until the problem becomes clear as day. And he's warning us about how can we handle these things, the spiders in our lives that leave cobwebs that we get so entangled in, that we're wrapped up in, that we struggle to move forward with, we're paralyzed by those moments. And he says, so often we realize that they're there, but yet we use our own strength, our own power, our own means. We use numbing agents from our culture, alcohol, and things like that to use to deal with the webs of our lives, to struggle with how am I going to deal with these things. And so we use these things to just stop it. And yet it never stops it. It just pulls us away from it. When we awaken again, we realize that they're still there. Proverbs 26, 5 reminds us, says, humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city, lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. What we begin to see is we can't hide from those haunting things that we have. Rather, he says, I need you to face them. Face the fear. But fear has motivated our decisions at times. It motivates us to use our own strength and our own power. And it reminds us that so often... Our decisions are dictated by our fears, not by our passions. That cobweb consumes us. We swing and we reach to get out. And yet there we are and it just sticks to us. And he's telling us, how can we break free as a culture? We've got to kill that spider. 
and seek out the givenness that we've been given, the power that's been placed upon us. But he says that fear will have us act outside of grace. We know Jesus is our Savior, but at times we feel like we still need of saving. That I'm still needing more. And he says that we must put our faith in our minds, not in the things of the world, but in our Lord and our Savior, to be built up and not brought down. Our power doesn't even compare to His. Our journey, our strength, won't even lead us to that point, but we begin to see that sometimes the Lord will calm the storms of our lives. And then sometimes He lets the storm rage as He calms His child. See, sometimes we ask Him to break that, and yet He says, I've equipped you to handle the storm, to comfort us within it. He says we, we don't have to hide to be victorious because victory already dwells inside of us. We are proclaimers of truth, of what we've experienced. And so today we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It's going to be an underlining verse for this entire series for the next couple of weeks. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love of self-control. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He was letting Timothy know as he's writing him, he's an encourager. He, he was allowing Timothy to grow in his faith, but he says, I'm still going to mentor you. I'm still going to reach out to you as you were young and you're walking and your journey here. And so as he sees her, he says, they know what you have something, but he recognized that something was about Timothy. As much as he's done, as much as he's gone and he's been serving, fear still dwelt inside him. He still became timid at times, weak. And he's reminded him, he says, that you have this giftedness that's inside of you. As last week we talked about where it comes from, what you've experienced, Timothy, understand that's your confident overflow. And because of grace, you've received new gifts. It says that you've been given the gift of power, love, and self-control. But for many, our biggest fear is just not being in control. Maybe our own lives, our loved ones, our health. Always huge concerns, huge fears. What he says is that our fear is outside of controlling everyday lives, everyday situations. But fearful when we get into the moment when we walk into the web. When we lose control of who we've designed and we've created and we sought to be. We spiral downhill and we find ourselves in that dark place. It feels so empty and broken. See, what happens is fear takes control from us. Makes us respond in a way we didn't plan to. And as Paul is noticing this in Timothy, the timidness that he would share at times, he's encouraged him to understand the fear that he felt, the fear that you're experiencing, that weakness, that brokenness that's inside of you right now, it is not from God. It is not from God. And so as he's writing, he says, understand, this is what God did give you. In those moments when you feel like, I just can't handle why he's going through this, why is he sending this at me? He reminds him that this is what he sent you. He says that we all have spiders in our lives. We get caught up at different times, in different natures, different places. And the thing is, though, we all have general fears, whether it's just standing up in front of somebody in a group setting, or maybe it's just being rejected, or feeling like we need to belong, or your health concerns, relationships, jobs, success, finances. Should we go on? We could talk about fears all day. Things that worry us and concern us. But he's telling him, he says, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. But the thing is, though, as he's responding to that, telling someone not to listen to the fears and the anxieties of your heart, is like telling someone not to walk into the cobweb in the door they didn't see. The thing is, though, we'd be able to avoid those things if we could see them all the time. But the problem is, we often walk in and we just catch it. We get concerned. And so he begins to tell us that, in those moments when we're caught by surprise, we must understand that our fears and our worries and anxieties don't come from God, but at the same time, we have to understand what power and strength dwells inside of us because Satan will use anything he can to destroy us, to break us down. And Satan will use all our fears to keep us from God's blessing. Satan will use all our fears to keep us from God's blessing. He desires for us to stay back, to retain, not to experience what God has for us. 
So as we deal with our fears, we must understand that God has given us the tools to defend ourselves. Once again, as it says in verse 7 there, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. When we do Christ's work, when we proclaim His goodness, when we seek Him out, we're representing His kingdom, we're His hands and feet into this culture. But the thing is, all we know sometimes is fear. While it might not be the same, it's something that we've all experienced, something we could share upon. But the thing is that what we understand about fear is it causes turmoil in our lives. It steals time away from others and from God. And yet it often changes nothing. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Anxiety, they depress us, disable us. And so often you might think, I can't take any more of what God's throwing at me right now. It's so often an overused statement, but at the same time, we have to understand that fear does not come from our God. On the other side, if God wanted to hit you, he wouldn't miss. So what we understand is we have to understand the good word that comes from God. That that peace that we have through his power and his love and that self-control of our mind and we experience that peace of relationship, a closer walk with God, a strength to stand upon that changes things around us. He says, I've given you this mighty power, this mighty power that dwells inside of you. And he follows that up with the sins of love there. And here's the thing, that his love is so great, is so strong, but at the same time, this love, this word right here is using as a word to describe the might of his power, the might of his strength that he's been given to us. We think that I have power to control others, to control situations. It says that Jesus' power is great, but his power and love is even stronger. We see Jesus exemplify this in John chapter 13, 1 through 11, as he understands that all has been given upon him. All things were given into his hand, and so as he uses this power, he says, I've been equipped that God has anointed and blessed me, and so what am I going to use this? He goes to wash the disciples' feet, using his power through love. We begin to see as he serves here, that great power and that great love will be rounded out through self-control. We see the spirit of being self-controlled, as Greek translates into sound mind, where fear makes us panicked and confused and rushed. But he says a sound mind helps us approach things with peace, understanding. To set this all up, Paul is telling something to not to accept what was given to him by this world, but only accept what was given to him by Christ. We all will fear. We all will struggle. Yes, it's crippling. But he says our beginning step to survival is to be walking with Christ. And as he's writing to Timothy, he's reminding him of this boldness. He says, without being bold, how are we going to fulfill God's promise? Because Satan will hold us back and try to steal what was given to us. But here he is in the silence, riding the chimney, says that you have every opportunity to take what God has been giving to you to fulfill God's purpose. And he says, look outside of what culture tells you your purpose is. It's more than money. It's more than being entertained. It's more than being comfortable. He says, you can use your tools to reach others, Timothy. He says, it's not here just about to find God, but to seek. Seek him. And here's what we understand, because in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by the prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He's writing them here to remind them of this command that he's given, not just an option, but a command here. He says, as you live and as you walk, go before your king, go before your maker, request something, let your life have something required of it. But he's reminding me, he says, this is how it happens. He says, live in a way that you're seeking out to know. Because here's the thing, so often we like to have that control, but fear cripples us because we don't know and we don't understand what's ahead of us in the process and the plan. And as we understand this, we begin to see that so often that's all we desire is just to know. And he's reminding me, he says, that we do not know. We do not know the ways of our Lord. We do not know his timing or his day or the way or the path. 
what he's going to use to get your attention to move you. But he says in this, he says, as you go to God, go to God with petition of prayer. That there's been so many things that could have been answered to your prayers, but we've never even given them up to God. We never even prayed those prayers yet. And as he goes through this process, he says, remind us, he says, that we have this thanksgiving of joy inside of us. He says, because of that power, because of that love, because of the sound mind, self-control, we understand peace. We see that it's written three different ways for peace from God is our first one. And Paul uses this as an introduction to his letters, is reminding them of what they've experienced. Experience this, that you'd have peace from what you know. Peace of the gift of God. Peace of what has been given on your behalf. We also see that we have peace with God. This is the relationship that we enter in when we come to Christ. As we give our lives that we understand because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, now we are at peace with God. Our debt has been paid. And yet he's challenging them to this third one. It's peace of God. It's what he speaks of here. He said this beyond all mind... It's beyond all our power of thinking. He says, when the webs of fear and they clear out over us and they break our sense, he says, it gives us that peace of hope beyond ourselves. When we have a peace of God, it's not about understanding with our minds, but he says, it's something that you've gone for, that you've sought out and you've experienced. He's seeking that we'd experience God. He wants to me, he says, in those moments when you're timid, you're lacking because you're missing out on actually experiencing a moment with your Savior. And he says, when we lose our peace, we drop the guard of our hearts. Our fear will break down our lack of self-control, keeping us using our gifts of love and power for the King. God wants us each to take His power, His love, His calm thinking, and as we experience Him, we can overcome fears. But the thing is, what He says is, He says that I've been giving you these gifts. And He's inviting the church, and as He's telling Timothy to experience, He says, this is an awakening of your senses. On those days like today, as you're walking through the building, you can smell the food, your senses are revived, you're like, oh, that's refreshing. He says, each day in our walk that we'd be renewed, a new sense our eyes will be open to a new day, a new sunshine, a new glory, the fresh smell. Spiritually, we'd be renewed. And so as he's writing the Timothy on timidness here, control in our fears, we're reminded that so often it goes in waves and paths. And sometimes, yeah, we're not going to be able to overcome all those anxieties, those fears, but he says as we walk daily, we'll be reminded of who he is. Be able to walk more in peace every day. And so he's telling them, step one, we have to start identifying the spider in our lives. What's the thing? What's the fear? What's holding us back? What's the thing that, yeah, we've cleaned out a lot of the cobwebs, but it's still producing cobwebs underneath the stairs in the back of our hearts and our minds. Then once we've identified, we have to start beginning the process to kill it. And we do that through His power and His love and our sound mind, knowing who our Savior is, knowing what we've experienced because we've shared upon that. And He says, once we've done that, then we go through the process of cleaning out the cobwebs of our lives. Church, He's empowered us. We can rejoice in His strength. We can rejoice in what has been done on our behalf. And all He says has come is that we'd live it out and experience freedom. In the midst of all the webs and turmoil, he's inviting us to experience peace.